Senator Sanders, you recently released 10 years of your tax returns. I did. Let's talk about that topic. Uh, we'll start with Ellen Burstein. She's a freshman at Harvard and grew up in Massachusetts. What's your question for the senator? Senator Sanders, thank you for being here. Your tax returns recently revealed that you are, in fact, a millionaire. How would you respond to concerns that your financial status undermines your authority as someone who has railed against millionaires and billionaires? OK, well, that's a good question. And here it is. All right, you ready to have me plead guilty? I plead guilty to have written a book which was an international bestseller, OK? <laughs> and when you write a book that makes it to the top of the New York Times bestseller list, you make money, and I made money. I suspect that in a couple of years, my salary will go back to 173000 which is what a member of Congress gets. But I think your question should ask, well, now that you wrote a book, you made money, and, and is that going to mean that you change your policies? Well, you're looking at somebody who not only voted against Trump's disastrous tax plan, 83% of the benefits going to the top 1%, but I have and will continue in this campaign to fight for progressive taxation. In other words, whether it is Bernie Sanders or your family or anybody else in America, when we have so much income and wealth inequality, when the people on top are doing phenomenally well, yeah, if you are doing very, very well in our economy, you should be paying your fair share of taxes. We will raise those taxes for the upper income people. We will do away with the tax loopholes and the tax breaks that large private corporations currently receive. Do you happen to know, anybody here happen to know how much Amazon paid in taxes last year? Zero. All right, owned by the wealthiest guy in America. That is a absurd tax system, a regressive tax system, and if elected president, I will change that tax system. All right, two quick follows. One, you said you expect your salary to go back down to 100. Unless I write another bestseller, I don't know. Or. <laughs> Who makes more than that? What does the president of the United States make? You're right. What does he make? I don't even 400. know. 400. So you're saying that you're not going to win? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. All right. I just want to be clear. I just want to be clear. You know, all that I'm saying is I don't think anyone seriously believes that because I wrote a best selling book it and changed made money, that I've changed my views. And you now hear me saying, gee, maybe we want to give tax breaks to millionaires. I don't think you've heard right. me say that. One, one more on this, though. So. You made a lot more money than you did the year before because of the book. Uh, charitable donations, when we look at your taxes, uh, went up, but they didn't go up proportionally. I'm not coming after you about what you gave in your donations. My question is this. Having the experience of having a lot more money and deciding what you wanted to do with it, did it give you new perspective about how people with more money feel about the government or someone like you no. forcing policies that demand them to give amounts as no. opposed to what they want to give. As a matter of fact, if you read those tax returns, you will find that I think people have said it. We were not aggressive. You know, we didn't go to accountants and figure out how we can possibly pay the lowest amount in taxes. Probably paid more than we should have. But let me just say this. You raise an interesting question, Chris. I grew up in a family that was a working class family. I lived in a rent controlled three and a half room apartment in Brooklyn, New York. And every single day of my life, I knew what paycheck to paycheck life was about. I knew what tension was about in a family. And I will tell you the difference now. You know what? When I was a kid, my family had to worry about how they're going to pay this bill or how they're going to pay that bill. I don't have to worry about that now. That stress is off my family. And that is a great relief. And I have spent my entire life and hopefully will conclude my political life in the White House trying to make sure that every person in this country does not have to deal with the stress of whether they can afford to pay the electric bill, whether they're going to have health care, whether they can send their kids to child care. So that is the difference that I've learned. You know what? It's great not to have to worry about whether your electricity or your phone bill is going to be shut off. And I want every person in this country, the wealthiest country in the history of the world, to be able to live in that kind of way. Next question, Gabriel Cedarberg, sophomore at Harvard, studying government from Minnesota. Gabriel. Hi, Senator. Hey, Gabriel. What is one thing that you have changed your mind about recently? <laughs> Nothing. I've been consistent for, no, just kidding. <laughs> um, I think I am paying more attention right now to foreign policy, okay? And I think 
I, I was rightfully criticized the last time I ran that I didn't pay as much attention as I might. And I think, you know, the economic issues, whether or not people have health care, whether they have decent paying jobs, whether we deal with climate change are enormously important. But you know what? We got to look at the United States' role in the world as well. And probably a few years ago, I would not have been as involved as I have recently been in demanding and helping in the Senate to pass a resolution to get the United States out of the Saudi-led intervention in Yemen, something which I think... And, and for, for the first time in 45 years under the War Powers Act, it has been successfully used. We did it in the Senate. We did it in the House. Sadly, tragically, Trump vetoed it. But to answer your question, I think I think a little bit more about foreign policy issues uh, than I previously did.